Now I can come up. The, uh, many of you know that we have this uh, framework of formation, this roadmap or this pathway of apprenticeship. And there's these nine practices that we do to collectively as a congregation to seek to find uh, Christ-likeness more formed in our hearts and more image, more of our lives taken on His image. And one of those practices that we do is to engage in cross-cultural experiences where we can put ourselves outside of the normal kind of daily life that we have in order to experience something and to see God's kingdom all over this world. And the last two, uh, two weeks ago, we spent uh, a week in Honduras, partnering with a ministry there that's called Heart to Honduras. And we have done that last year. We did it this year. We took 26 people to Honduras this year, and you saw a video that the people in, in Honduras put together for us to kind of celebrate what God had been doing through our team. It's a good thing for us uh, to purpose our lives uh, in a way to kind of put ourselves out of our normal comfort zone, and so that's what we do when we go to Honduras. Uh, so this morning, what we wanted to do is kind of hear from a couple different perspectives of what God is doing in uh, Honduras with the people. So we asked three people to come up. Uh, you'll see some different perspectives. You'll see a different um, understanding of what God has done. So we've asked Dylan to come up. We asked Casey Spencer to come up. And then we end with Bob Gould to come up. So Dylan, if you want to come up first. Yeah, good. So Dylan's going to tell a little bit about his perspective, and then, like I said, Casey will share a little bit, and then Bob will share, and then I'll come up and kind of uh, of understand a little bit more of what our church's role with Heart to Honduras and the role that uh, we're going to be playing in the years to come. So Dylan, let you start. Testing one, two, three. Uh, So my name is Dylan, and this past year was actually my second trip to Honduras. Um, And unfortunately for this year's VBS team, I'm their spokesperson. So... um, on my first, my first year, I was originally supposed to be on the VBS team, but um, Brian decided at the last minute that he needed a real man to show him how it's done on uh, the construction team. So he invited me over to the construction team. But this year, I was actually on the VBS team the whole time. Um, and the VBS team honestly just felt like it felt like tourism. Like we were going to tilapia farms, seeing how, um, how their trade worked. We were going into people's houses and experiencing their generosity as they allowed us to um, make tortillas. And uh, we were going on house visits and hearing their stories, telling them our stories. Um, and it just it felt like tourism. And I don't think while I was down there, I understood the gravity of what we were doing. Um, but it, when, I, when I got back, I think um, I'm thankful that Brian allowed me to be on the construction team both years because I think when I got back in the States, I think that's when I started to uh, realize the gravity of what we were doing relation, relationally because when I got back um, from my trip the first year, people would ask me uh, what I did, and I'd tell them that I built a house, and they were super interested, like, like what do you mean you built a house? How would you build it in a week? And they would ask me questions like, how would you build it so fast and, and stuff like that. They were super interested, but this year – when I got back, they would ask me what I did, and I told them that I built relationships. And then they'd look at me funny, and I have to explain what I meant. Um, and, and it got me to think, like, would I be that person to um, ask those questions um, when, uh, when all I did was go down to Honduras to just make friends with people? Would I, would I be that person? And um, now that I think about it, I definitely would have been. I think that's one of my biggest takeaways is understanding the gravity of a relationship and how – we can go down there and we can um, just be a part of their life and, and get an inside look on, on how they farm tilapia and um, how they make tortillas and, and the impact that we make when we do that. I think that was probably one of my biggest takeaways. So I'm glad I had the um, – I came in from a different angle from a construction team and I was able to experience, um, experience that. Um, another one of my biggest highlights was – because when we weren't going on house visits, we were helping with the kids. That's why we were – the, the VBS team, and we didn't have much of a lesson. It was more just games and crafts because such such a language barrier was there. But we were still able to connect with them so thoroughly. And I remember uh, one day we, we gave a talk, and uh, in between, uh, like, we were waiting on one of the construction teams to meet up with us for lunch, um, and we didn't have any kids in our classroom at that time. 
but we had this guy there who um, ran worship, and he was singing worship songs. And he wasn't necessarily bilingual, but he knew songs in both Spanish and in English. So we were singing worship songs in English, and it was in between classes for the school. And the kids, who obviously do not speak English, um, just started coming in and crowding around us. And they were just so proud to, to be there with us and to experience that with us. And they were trying to sing songs in, in English, which was really cool to see. And they were so proud of the few English words that they did know. Um, but yeah, that was probably one of my biggest takeaways, and uh, I will turn it over to Casey. So, <laughs> thank you. Well, like he said, my name's Casey. Um, this was actually my first missions trip ever. Um, I've traveled abroad, but I've never actually gone on a trip like this. Um, so it was one thing that I had been wanting to do since college. Um, I, the very first Uganda trip, um, that was something that I felt like I should do, but I just couldn't. Um, Time-wise, money-wise, everything, you know, life, college. Um, so I waited, and 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 then this year it finally worked out for me. So um, I finally got to go, and I will say that I never thought I was going to go to Honduras. Um, I always thought I was just going to go to Uganda because that was what I thought I was going to do. I mean, that was where I felt like I was going to be called, um, which hopefully I get to go next year. <laughs> um, but I'm really glad that I did get to go on this one. Um, I was on the house team, so like Dylan was talking about, we did build a house, and we did build it in three days. And yes, it was fast, but it was awesome. Um, they had all of the concrete stuff laid down for us, so we did um, basically everything from there up. Um, so it was really hot. There was no shade. Um, it was about 110 the first day when we were there. Um, so it was, it was interesting, um, but it was kind of fun just to see how everybody worked together, even though we couldn't communicate with them. Um, the man we were building the house for um, can't work because he had epilepsy. Um, so we were building this house for him and his family. Um, his wife was actually the one that the VBS team got to make tortillas with, um, and her job basically to carry the, the weight of the family was to make tortillas every day, and she made about 500, I believe, is what I heard, yeah? Um, 500 a day to sell um, to try and provide for the family. So obviously that's not going to be enough to get them a home. They were living with her aunt. Um, but it was, it was really cool to be able to build that for them and, and work alongside Alejandro. Um, I would say that my experience there, like, Brian kind of wanted us to kind of look and see the differences and similarities between what we see every day here and what we see there. Um, my biggest takeaway from that was kind of the clash of the times, I guess you could say. It's, you know, it's the 20, 21st century. Um, we saw a lot of cell phones, a lot of smartphones, Wi-Fi signs, all that kind of stuff, but we're also driving dirt roads. Um, we saw concrete floors, people living on concrete floors, dirt floors, um, no beds, just a mattress on the ground. Um, but then we would also drive by or drive through town, and there were really nice cars with, like, air conditioning. And then we also saw people in cattle trucks, in the back of cattle trucks, and riding horses. Um, so it was just really weird for me to see that because I wasn't really sure what to expect when I was going. Um, I would say, you know, going on this trip, I didn't really have a general idea of what I was going to be getting out of it. I was trying to go pretty, like, blank slate, not really thinking about it. Everybody was asking me beforehand, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? And I was like, mm, not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> not really. I haven't really thought about it. Um, you know, life, work, all that. But that was kind of the way I wanted to go because I didn't want to have that agenda. Um, and I was glad that I did. But at the same time, like, my week before I left was not great. Um, so I think God kind of laid it all out for me to be able to have a blank slate when I got there. Um, so I was able just to kind of forget everything that was going on at home. Um, I was able to completely withdraw myself from everything um, and just be, just be there. Um, so that was something that um, kind of let me, I guess, open myself up to God talking to me. But at the same time, I didn't really feel like I was getting anything out of the trip while we were there. Um, I mean, it was great experience. We got to hang out with cool people, meet new people, you know, experience the culture. Um, but about halfway through, I started thinking, okay, um, everybody else is starting to get something out of this. Why am I not getting anything out of this? Um, until like the last day or so, um, we were finishing up the house. Um, 
and I wasn't feeling great that day, so I sat in the shade. I think the heat was getting to me because, you know, 110. Um, but I was sitting in the shade with a couple of our translators, and we were just chilling, just hanging out, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, and we had three teenage translators, um, Anna, Elizabeth, and Benji. Uh, they are about 16, 17 years old, um, and they were great. They were great. Um, they were really fun to hang out with. We played games all through the week, all that. Um, but that time frame was the time frame that I realized that they were kind of the reason why I was there. Um, I've never been one to really hang out with a lot of teenagers because as a teenager, I wasn't a huge fan of teenagers. <laughs> no offense, guys. No offense. Um, <laughs> but growing up, I was always the one with the little kids. I mean, you guys see me back there where I'm working with the little kids. But um, here recently, I've been around teenagers more and interacting with teenagers more. I coach now. Um, and I think this is something that God's been kind of been slowly introducing me to. Um, so down there, I'm interacting with these three teenagers, and the other people were too, but for me personally, I felt like I was making a really big connection with Anna. Um, we talked a lot about my job. I mean, I work with animals. She wants to go into the medical field. Um, so we talked a little bit about that kind of stuff. Um, she wanted me to braid her hair, which seems like a really like little thing, but she said she's never had her hair braided which I thought was crazy because um, I braid my hair all the time. Um, so I was braiding her hair. We were playing games. We were just talking about random stuff. Um, but, you know, I realized I was clicking with her and with a couple of the, with the other two, but mostly with her. Um, and, you know, we were that last day at the house, not only were we hanging out just in the shade, but she that was the first day she was with us on that team. Um, and she didn't know how to use a hammer. <laughs> So for these teenagers, they grew up and were raised in San Pedro Sula, which is kind of like, it's the big city. Um, they're pretty privileged. They go to a nice school. They have cars, air conditioning, all of that. So for them to go on this mission trip with us um, was a big eye-opener for them, too. Um, they had never experienced that side of their country. Um, so being able to get down and dirty and learn how to use a hammer and help out their fellow countrymen, um, I think was a big eye-opener for them as well as for us. Um, so getting to walk alongside them with that was really cool for me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was just, it was one of those things. They taught me about their culture. We taught them about our culture. Um, and I just got to kind of click with them. So that was really cool for me, just to experience getting to know teenagers and realize that I'm s maybe I'm supposed to work with teenagers a little bit more. I don't know. <laughs> um, but my big teachable moment, I would say, um, after this, coming home, being home for a week, really starting to reflect on the trip um, was more along the lines of trusting God. Um, like I said, I had a bad week before we left. My week there was just a refocus week, I guess. Um, but I had two verses that kept popping up in devotion time. Um, we got letters and cards from people from home um, and just stuff like that. I had two verses that kept coming up. So the first one was Isaiah 41.10. Um, it says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you surely. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then the other one was Matthew 6, 33 through 34. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Um, so those two verses really just the word that kept coming up to me, even though it's not in those verses, is trust. Um, I've got to trust that he had everything under control in my life here, and he obviously has everything under control in Honduras because it was blatantly obvious that these people are not as well off as we are, <laughs> but they somehow are able to get through life every day and do well. Um, so it was, that was just kind of my thing. My takeaway was just that I have to trust him. And, you know, that's one of those things that just keeps popping up, you know, throughout life. But right now, for sure, it was a big thing. So that was me. So I'm going to let Bob kind of take over now. <laughs> that was pretty awesome listening to uh, Dylan and Casey share. Uh, I got several different perspectives, but uh, kind of tagging on to Casey's driving dirt roads, for those of you who are from my era, uh, in the words of Monty Python, ah, we dreamt of having dirt roads. Uh, we had to do a lot of travel on uh, 
uh, mountain, gravel, rough roads. There's a lot of bumps and bruises. Uh, but there's a lot of love and joy that was gained from this trip. Uh, I didn't introduce myself. My name's Bob, and I was on Team Latrine. <laughs> Where you at, Team Latrine? Let me hear you. Represent, baby. We didn't build a latrine. Things changed, which happens, and uh, we ended up putting cement floors in, which was an experience in itself, and uh, I think everybody really enjoyed the moment of working with these individuals. But as we would have our debriefs with Pastor Brian, a couple times he just kept coming to us and saying, look at the people. Look for the differences. Look for the similarities. Kind of put yourself in their shoes. Put them in your shoes. And here's kind of a takeaway that I came from that charge, I'll say. Uh, I scrubbed away all the surface stuff. Just absolutely scrubbed it away. Didn't want to look at where they were, what their situation was, what our situation was. And I come to realize that we all have basic needs. Now, for those of you who are, are in the psych profession, Maslow has a list of basic needs. I can't quote them off, but we all need water, food, shelter, clothing. We need love. We need family. And we need friends. And one thing that I learned is that no matter where we are, in our life, in whatever country, at some point in our life, we all need somebody to walk beside us. I was blessed with the opportunity to walk beside the individuals in Honduras. And there was many things that occurred. I think the thing that touched me the most, one of the things that touched me the most, was the fact that they completely opened themselves up made themselves completely vulnerable to us and led us into their life. Sometimes that's hard to do. If you're not an extrovert, if you're an introvert, then it's really hard to do. I, I don't know if these folks were introvert, whatever. But the job that we had of putting the floors in for my team, uh, our, our Lachine team had 10 people, so we split up into two groups. But we basically did the same thing. Uh, except for the other team also worked on the house, I believe, uh, a little bit. Uh, and what we did is we worked alongside the individuals in Honduras, the craftsmen who were there to put the floors in. Uh, you've seen in some of the pictures, we mixed the, the cement by hand. You had the sand, you had the Portland, and you carried the water in five-gallon buckets. You mix it up right there, and then you put it in wheelbarrows or five-gallon buckets, and you carry it into the home. The craftsmen actually opened themselves up enough that they even let individuals on our team help them with the finish work. Now, if you're a craftsman, the finish work's what's important. And, and so it was, it was very touching that uh, they would allow us to come in and, and help them with the finish work. Uh, and is, is Tara here? Tara's a beast. That girl will outwork I mean, anyone. She was, she was pulling mud. She was mixing. We had the situation where we'd have all this piled up in this big volcano-looking uh, situation. And then at some point, the wall gave way and the volcano erupted. That's where Tara was. She wanted to be in that moment. But she worked with the individuals side by side, just sweating away and just loving every minute of it. The thing is, is everybody on this team, everybody on all the teams, they gave 100%. I am so blessed and honored to have had the opportunity not only to work with the people in Honduras, to work with Hearts to Honduras, but to serve the community of Crossroads. Part of my spiritual growth, I've known for some time that I've been called to uh, work with youth. God's told me this. I've resisted. God told me again. I found an excuse not to. It just kept coming back. And 
the opportunity on this trip not only to work with the Hondurans and to work with the folks of Crossroad, but also to work with the youth here uh, was very valuable to me in my spiritual growth. And I, I would just like to say, um, for those of you who have been at Crossroads for a while, sometimes you wonder how the longevity of your church is going to go because your church is always the youth. That's your future. Our future is incredibly bright. We have an awesome bunch of youth. We have an incredible youth pastor that does a good job. And it was exciting to see these folks give of themselves daily, like they said, in 110 degree heat. And they not only served the Honduran people, but they served each other. We were constantly asking each other, did you have enough water? Do you want me to take that shovel? Uh, Cassidy, Cheryl, the folks that was on my team, and I'm sure it was this way on the other teams, we constantly made sure we served each other to make sure that we didn't get worn out and that we would have the strength to serve the folks of Honduras. Um, you know, God gave me a big head. I think it's because he just put so much in there, and sometimes it gets jumbled up. But uh, I guess I'd just like to say if, if you ever felt called to do an international trip, Honduras is an incredible opportunity. It's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful country. I've been blessed to see many countries since I gave my life to Christ. Honduras is the most beautiful country I've seen. It's a beautiful people. And the message and the drive for the folks at Heart to Honduras is spot on. Uh, give yourself an opportunity to experience that. One last thing I'd like to share with you and before the shepherd's hook comes out. Uh, we had many opportunities to worship uh, with the folks at Los Lomitos and several other churches that I can't pronounce. Uh, and the really cool thing is that it wasn't just them providing service. We had our youth playing in the band, singing. The songs were partly in Spanish, partly in English, and I am absolutely telling you, at each one of those that I experienced, the Holy Spirit was absolutely present. It was a phenomenal opportunity. I hope to have that again, and I hope that some of you have that opportunity to take that in and to involve that into your life. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Hey, before I, I just have a couple of words about Honduras as well, uh, just a, a kind of a sheer moment of just kind of family business for a second. I don't know uh, the family that's got the kid that's been, that's been crying, but I just want you to know that you are very welcome. You are not distracting us. Uh, your kids are welcome here. Uh, we love having them in the service to be a part of us. We recognize that that's part of the messiness of being in a family. Uh, if you have kids of your own, you know how that goes. So I know that you've kind of gone back and forth, but would you just know that from my heart to yours that you and your family and your kids are welcome here. They're welcome in our services. So please, I... I know that it feels awkward and weird and you feel like you got to walk out and all that kind of stuff, but please just know that. And all of you, uh, if your kids are, are making noises or doing those kind of things, that is, that's part of life and that's part of what it means to be a family together. So, uh, so just know that. I just want you to know that. I know that it feels like you sometimes feel like you got to leave and, and that kind of stuff. And I get that. I understand it. But just know that from my, my heart to yours, I just, all right, uh, for, as it regards the heart to Honduras and the ministry and how it plays into our purpose and our mission as a, as a church family as well. I mentioned that we have this framework of formation, this pathway of formation, and one of those things is to transmit hope or to learn to transmit hope. And part of that means that we are taking uh, places or put, putting our place or putting ourselves in places uh, where we can interact with people cross-culturally. 
There is something very powerful that happens when you recognize that there are people that live in this world that worship the one true living God that are different than you and I that speak a different language, that live in a different culture, that live in a different kind of era, that have a different perspective of life. There's something very powerful that can happen to your vision of who God is as it expands to include every tribe, nation, tongue, and place on this planet. That the kingdom of God is not centered centered in America. That the kingdom of God is not centered in Lima, Ohio. It's not centered on crossroads, but the kingdom of God is expanding all in this world and it includes all peoples from all time and all places. And so it's good for us to walk alongside people like that. It shapes our hearts to be more like Jesus in that way. But in particular with Heart to Honduras, Heart to Honduras would identify poverty differently than what we typically think of poverty. They would identify poverty in in kind of four different areas. The first would be material poverty, where you just don't have things. You don't have material goods. And we can all agree with that kind of poverty. But then they also recognize that there are three other levels of poverty. That there's emotional poverty, that you can think less of yourself than what is how God sees you. There's also spiritual poverty where you just are walking the road and you don't have any understanding of your life with God or any kind of understanding of your spiritual life at all. And then there is relational poverty where you don't have friends, you don't have people near you, you don't have a support system. And it's one thing to come alongside someone and just address their material poverty but not to deal with their emotional, relational, or spiritual poverty. And one of the things that Heart to Honduras does, which I find very fascinating and very encouraging, is they seek to understand how can we alleviate material poverty, emotional poverty, relational poverty, and spiritual poverty. And I would said this to our team while we were down there, and I'll say it to you as well, that you will, it will be hard for you to find the kind of material poverty that we found in Honduras here in Lima. There are materially poor people in our area. There are. There are people that are living without a whole lot of means. There are for sure. But there will, you will be hard to find the kind of material poverty that we found in Honduras in our area. The kind of living situations and the kinds of lack of running water whatsoever. Lack of access to water or electricity whatsoever. You will be hard to find that kind of poverty in Lima. But you for sure, for sure will find the same amount of emotional poverty, relational poverty, and spiritual poverty right here. You don't have to go to Honduras or to Ecuador or to Costa Rica or to Uganda or any place else to find that kind of poverty. You can go across the street and you can find emotional, relational, and spiritual poverty. And so what, is God, what God has called us to do as, as apprentices to Him is to learn to live our life by faith, to learn to transmit hope, and to learn to be known by love, to model and to demonstrate a different kind of life for people who are emotionally, relationally, spiritually poor, that they may see us, they may see the fellowship of this church, of this body, and the servanthood, and the self-sacrifice, and the way in which we care for one another, that they would see that, and they would recognize that it points to another way, to a kingdom where God is on the throne, and that he's the one calling the shots. And they would be intrigued by that. And they would come alongside, and they would ask you, and they would ask me, what is it about this Jesus? What's going on with this Jesus? And we might have an opportunity to give the hope for by which we profess, which is a wonderful thing, which is a wonderful thing. So I want to encourage each of us, in your apprenticeship to Jesus, there comes a time where we need to place ourselves in a place where we are serving cross-culturally, where we place ourselves in as a servant role, where whatever we need to do, we serve and we learn that God's kingdom is bigger than what we've ever imagined. That it is not limited to our own understanding and our experiences right here, but we get to see God's kingdom expand all over the world. So I'd encourage you in your own apprenticeship to Jesus to find ways to put yourself in ways in paths where you can have cross-cultural experiences. And I want to put a little teaser out there for you if you're beginning to kind of be stirred up by anything like this. That next year we're going to be taking a team, and but next year's team is going to be going to Uganda. 
We have partners there in Uganda that we've been serving alongside with for some years now. And 2020 is going to be the next time that we go back to Uganda. It's going to be in August, the first couple of weeks of August. So just begin to put in your mind and, and to plant the seed that you may be called to go on this international trip with us to Uganda 2020. We're going to be sending teams down to, Uganda, or down to Honduras on a regular basis as well. And there will be more opportunities to go serve with the people of Heart to Honduras. But I just want to put a plant the seed that uh, in 2020, in August of 2020, we're going to be heading down or heading out to Uganda. And we would love to bring more and more of us on a trip like this to give you an opportunity to see God's kingdom at work. And to find ways in which you can place yourself as a servant to learn to see that God's people and God's kingdom come in all shapes, sizes, languages, colors, creeds, everything, that we might be able to see them with the the eyes of Jesus. And may our hearts be impacted as well. Let me pray for us and we'll continue. Jesus, we're grateful that you've given the 26 of us an opportunity to see your kingdom at work in Honduras. We pray for Henry and for Edouard and for Orlean and for the others that are in Heart to Honduras and for their work down there. That as they are even working now, that you would find, they would find you faithful to them and, and encouraging. Father, I pray for us as we gather, as we enjoy the rest of the afternoon together and have lunch together. I pray that you would uh, bond us together in unity. That we may see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen.